<clears throat> this is tough. Uh, I'm not going to say I won't cry. I will. Uh, <clears throat> Forty years. It's a long time. Just to illustrate how long that is. If some young man came up to this retreat in 1976, he'd now be 60 years old. It's a long time. We've heard me say that behind every man is a story. And behind every one of you is a story. And that story is all about Jesus. But the years of these retreats, there's a story, but it's not just a story. It's not just history. It's his story. For those of us that have been around these retreats a number of years, you would agree with me that this is his story. This is his workings. This is his doings. There's absolutely no doubt that the Lord has used these times together to bless and impact and to teach men in an awesome manner. There's so many blessings that have occurred that are unknown to us. <clears throat> I got some advice from my other half, I was going to say better half, but the other half. Um, she said, you're going to get up there and you're going to talk about what the Lord's done for 40 years and you're going to bore to death those guys that are new. Keep, them, keep it short. Keep them. Remember them. They don't need to hear all this. While we reminisce, I told her I couldn't promise. It's one of the interesting things about this this gathering, it's a retreat that's not sponsored by any group. It's not a ministry, it's not a church. Amen. It's not, it's a group of guys for the most part that don't see each other from one year to the next. Mm -hmm. That's very unique. Over 1,100 different men have come to these 40 years. 1,100 men have heard about Jesus here. That's his story. I remember last year, after Ed finished speaking one time, Dana got up to take his turn, and reflecting on Ed's message, he made this comment. He said, 75,000 men should be seated in the stadium hearing that message. Remember saying that? You and I have been blessed. One man, pardon me, I've got to use this. One man said to me recently, I've been to a lot of retreats in my life, and they all have fellowship. They all have singing, and they all have Bible study, but there's something different. Mm -hmm. Something different. You know why? Because it's not a ministry. It's not a doctrine. It's Jesus. That's why it's different. One of the brothers who meant a lot to me and to a lot a number of you guys with the guy with the red suspenders yeah. named Tom Lynch. Yeah. Yeah. Tom Lynch would do this every single year he was here until he went home to be with the Lord. After it was over, we got everything cleared out. Time to go home. He'd come up to me. He'd say, Bob, I hate to say this. He'd say the same thing. I hate to say this, but it was the best one ever. <laughs> every year, every year, I can count it. 
and then I visited him in the hospital not long before he went to be with the Lord. And uh, he said, of course I obeyed him like I always do. And, and he said, uh, keep the main thing the main thing. Good lesson for life, guys. Over the years, so many men who have attended the retreat or two or three have gathered with their sons and grandsons and brought them here. This year, I forgot my count, but it's somewhere around 50 sons and grandsons of previous attenders are here this weekend. Why? Why? The Jesus thing. It's his story. I posted on the board over there a, a list of the guys that have been here 20 years or more, 10 years or more. And I'm going to do something. I'm going to call your name. These are the guys that have been here 20 years or more. So they're the guys to keep the thing going. If everybody stopped, it wouldn't have it. I just want you to see who these guys are. So if I call your name, you stand up. Okay. I'm starting at the top with a guy that's not even here because he's suffering in Colorado because of some family wedding, and he'll be in Friday morning if he gets here, on Sunday morning if he gets here for the red-eye flight back from Colorado. But that's Dan Barton Schrager, 36 years. Gene Neff, Mark Smith, Tom Wontrop, Dana Condon, Ed Miller, Steve Powers, Joe Fine Allen, Bill Pritchett, Gone to Glory, Dave Truman, Tom Lynch, Gone to Glory, Mark Roman, Wayne Johansson, unable to be here, Ed Meskey, Dick Boyce, James Dotson, Jeff Ogoboro, Matt Matty Pavola, aren't they here? Hmm, too many jokes. <laughs> Pat Santos is not here. Steve Ward, Bruce Robinson, Preston Chilcoat, Born to Glory, Dean Hoover, Barry Koch, Dave Noski, Tim Witherwright, Bill Peck, un unable to be with us, Murray Wilson, not here, Terry Zankovich, Myron Miller, Dave Wilkins, gone to glory, mm -hmm. the only one who ever died on property here. Yeah. Went from here. Mm -hmm. Tommy and mine, 19 years. Mark Griffin, 19 years. Tim Kick, 19 years. Steve McCurdy, 19 years. Larry Sharawan, 19 years. It goes on and on. Thank you, guys. Come on. I can't speak for you, but I can speak for myself. Before I say that, I got to tell you this. I wrestled over this. Many a morning, I'd wake up, and the Lord and I've been figuring out what to say. I go down, write something else down. Next morning, I'd wrestle again. Is that good enough to write something else down? I thought, oh, forget this. A couple weeks ago, the restaurant stopped. It was done. And I finally got some rest until I got up here. <laughs> <laughs> I can speak for myself, and I think I speak for a number of you, that these retreats have been of the most wonderful times in our lives. <coughs> for you rookies, 
we laugh a lot. We laugh at the Saturday night fun from guys like Dr. Neff. We could never figure out why the men would laugh at his corny joke. <laughs> to the three little pigs in German, <laughs> to the appearing of two sumo wrestlers in the middle of the <laughs> it, See, you had to be here to understand. Never mind. No, 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 no. no mo it? sumo. No mo sumo. <laughs> Commemoration. <laughs> And if, if you're new here, <coughs> you, know that, you know that men do cry. I got some brothers here who cry when you say the word cry. <laughs> when the Lord touches your heart, most people will cry. Meeting together here with the Lord Jesus has given us opportunity to know some of his special men. <coughs> the times of being able to get together and study the Word of God and have real worship, not ceremony, worship. For those of you who are here for the first time leaving this retreat, without a life-changing encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ will be the most memorable mistake of your life. You get straight with Jesus now because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Some of you have heard words about the past and I'm trying not to bore those who or younger. But how did this retreat come about? When? Who was involved? In order to tell you as much as this his story as I can, I must very reluctantly speak of my own testimony. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, I was born in 1934. In June, I'll be 82 years old. Married uh, my bride, and I need it again. Married my bride over 57 years ago. <clears throat> I didn't know it then, but she was a perfect partner for me. Amen. Three children. Two on planet Earth and one in glory. I have a younger brother. I did. He died. And a younger sister. I lived in Maryland all our lives until 1945 when my father took a job at a radio station in New Bern, North Carolina. You see, my father was a womanizer. He's chased out of town by an angry husband. So he had many such relationships in North Carolina. So when I was 12 years old, our father packed up the wife and the kids and dropped them off at the house of, his, of my mother's sister back in Maryland and deserted the family. In all the years that followed, I only saw him two times. And both of those times had to do with his mother's illness and then going home. All those years, absolutely no contact. No phone calls, no letters, no cards, no response to our wedding invitation, zero. Only two times I saw him were those two times he came to see his mother. And one of those two brief encounters, 
I attempted to share the good news of Jesus with him, but I was strongly rebuffed. He married another woman without divorcing my mother. It was approximately 10 years after he died that I found out he was dead. The result of this was I have absolutely zero father-son memories. Zero. No stories of growing up. No stories of father-son talks. Nothing. And that had a very profound effect on my life. Even though I didn't realize it early on. I grew up through my teen years <clears throat> trying to be accepted, <clears throat> trying to fit in with the jocks. I had a chance to be a member of the Baltimore County 1952 basketball championship team. Had a very good seat at the end of the bench. <laughs> but I was on the team. <laughs> In those days, I was so, I was so naive. I, I had not yet figured out the benefit of spending a lot of time with girls. At times, my mother would drag the kids to Sunday school and the church, but it meant nothing to me. Most likely, the best I can understand, the gospel wasn't preached there. And then in 1957, at age 23, I'm still single. I'm single. I'm still without Jesus Christ. Because of an ill-advised relationship, my heart was broken, and I began to search for something. <coughs> At that time, there was a song that was popular by a lady, a woman named Judy Gorham, and it was called Somewhere Over the Rainbow way up high. And that's all I could remember. This was what's going through my mind all the time. I'm miserable, but somewhere, somewhere out there, there's something. I was in the National Guard for nine years. The first five years of those times in the Guard, I would use those weeks of summer camp at Fort Bragg to make an ass of myself. Just plain stupid things that men do when they get away from the family and there's no restraints on what you can do. And not being a Christian, it was obvious I knew what to do. After returning from Fort Bragg one summer, I met a friend who, who was in the guard with me who start, started talking to me about Jesus. We met one night. That's musical background. <laughs> <laughs> he met, we met one night and he told me the one that I was searching for somewhere was Jesus Christ. He said this, and I never forgot it. He said, you were so prepared by the Holy Spirit that all I had to do was say Jesus, and you jumped. You were ready. Now, 59 years later, it's still Jesus. God led me to a Bible preaching church where I met Sherry, and we were married in 1959. <laughs> I had an interesting, I was 25, she was 18. I had a, a saying back then, don't ever believe this one. I said, marry him young and train him the way you want him. <laughs> I married him young and she trained me the way she wanted him. <laughs> Two years later, 
we had a baby girl. Good time, good time. Yeah. There was a problem. Because of my background, I didn't know how to be a father. But I wanted to be a good one. Thankful, oh, I made lots of mistakes. You can be sure. But thankful for a little girl. I always had a deep <coughs> heart's desire to have a son. Perhaps to fill that father-son relationship that I never had. My wife is a diabetic. She's 50 years diabetic now. And at that time, the doctor says it's impossible for your wife to get pregnant. Again, the Lord knows what he's doing. In working out unexplainable details, in 1968, a baby boy, two days old, entered our family as our son. That's Mark. Through a doctor. If any of you have gone through the adoption process, it can be a real hassle. Well, this is what he did. This is what God did. We signed one paper, and it cost us $50. Here's your son. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I didn't know how to be a father, but I wanted to be a good one. And I made lots of mistakes. But Jesus was not finished yet. In the mid-1975, what the doctor said was impossible happened. Sherry became pregnant. She went full term. No signs of problems until the last two weeks. It went February 6, 1976. Our baby was stillborn, dead on arrival. <clears throat> Guess what? The boy. We named him Scott. I didn't know it then, but God said, I have plans for that boy. Knowing that Jesus was in control of our lives, having been believers for a good while, it, it still hurt. But that made the hurt a lot less. Especially when we remember certain scriptures about children. But to this day, I remember the hurt in my wife's heart. I remember her sobbing in the hospital. I remember her giving me instructions to go home and take that room apart that we just put together. You know, it's one thing to be a father of a child you never knew, but it's another thing to be a mother especially one who is a perfectionist, who always takes care of herself in an exceptional way, who carried her son in a room for nine months, and to have her heart broken. See, she's as much a part of this retreat as I am. Let me give you a word of wisdom. A mother never forgets her children. I'll tell you a little story, if I can get through this. We had some next door neighbors who were good friends of ours. And the lady next door, her name was Marion. Um, 
she was ill and not ready to go to glory. And we went to the hospital to visit her. And my wife sings to her. Guess what song she sang? I'll fly away. <laughs> she prayed with her. Then this happened 33 years after the baby was born. She said, she bends over and says, Marion, will you do me a favor? Marion could just about move her head. She shook it, yes. My wife said, will you hold my baby? She don't forget. She looks forward now to that day. It was in the fall of 1976 that the Lancaster Bible College Choir came to our church and they needed places for some of the young people to stay overnight and two of the boys came to my house. One of them, by the name of Mike Mercer, who has a few relatives here today, saw that I was listening to some tapes. And he gave me two tapes by some guy by the name of Ed Miller. He said, hey, these are free. Why don't you listen to them? <laughs> and I listened to them. They were in the book of Isaiah. At the end of one of the tapes, Ed made this comment. This is part of his story. He said, if anyone is interested in the doctrine of universal infant salvation, let me know. Guess what I did? I let him know. <laughs> to my knowledge, among the thousands of tapes that Ed has ever recorded, this is the only tape hmm. in that library where this is much. God used two young men, a house visit, one tape, one statement at the end of a message. To create 40 years of this. Ed replied by responding to me with an 11-page handwritten letter. That's what this yellow envelope is. It's dated uh, October 30th, 1976. Here's what he wrote. I've asked Ed to come read it to you because maybe you need to hear this. Ed? Todd, you're the only one who can read it. <laughs> Before I read this letter, um, when the information came to me, I was under the impression, because of the way Bob requested, that he wanted to know about universal infant salvation. And I thought he had doubts that his baby went to heaven. And so that was my burden. And I got to give you one other little background. Before that happened, the reason I was so excited on the tape, my sister had uh, a baby. And uh, it never developed in her stomach and uh, in her womb. And uh, the head was like the size of a golf ball. And she came to me. She was a believer. And she asked if I knew what happened to babies when they died. And I said I did not know because I had never studied that. But I promised her I would. And so I went before the Lord. And the light that he gave me was just before I got this letter. And I was so excited 
that God had given me some light. And when I got his letter, then now I'll read the letter. This is, that was my heart, and this is what I wrote. <laughs> Dear Brother Bob, my heart was greatly touched by your letter, and I'd be glad to share with you what I know of your son's salvation. God gave me what I will share with you on the occasion of my nephew's death. At that time, I sought the Lord for some clear teaching on the subject. I hope some of these thoughts will minister comfort to you and your wife as they did to me. I didn't want to take this to be impersonal, and yet I feel I must lay it out in some logical connection. So please bear with me. First of all, my heart was not satisfied with verses that were shared with me, such as 2 Samuel 12, 23, I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. I see that could refer to his eternal state with the Lord, but it seemed more natural for me to interpret it simply as death. David seemed to be saying, weeping won't bring him back to life. I can't bring him life. Someday I'll follow him in death. The other verses that were often used were verses having to do with Jesus blessing children. Or Psalm 8, 2, from, my mother, from the mouths of infants and nursing babes, thou hast established strength. These also were not soul satisfying to me. To follow the doctrine logically, we must trace every step to its logical conclusion. Number one, are babies saved? If they are saved, then they have the Holy Spirit. If they have the Holy Spirit, he will not leave them. Since all have been babies, that would lead to universal salvation. And the whole human race would be saved if that were the case. So we conclude infants are not saved, but they are safe. If they die, they are saved. Of course, I shall show you scriptures in a moment to bear that out. But now I have a passion for accuracy. Babies are safe. The second observation I'd like to point out is that, as far as I know, there's no single scripture that comes right out and says in so many words, babies are safe. I believe it's very clearly taught, but not in one single verse. I believe God was wise in recording. Isn't that nice? I believe God was wise. <laughs> I believe God was wise in responding to the doctrine as he did. That's 40 years ago. I've come a little bit. <laughs> If there were a single definite verse saying, babies that die in infancy go to heaven, then the uninstructed parents would commit infanticide, murder their own babies in times of calamity and war. Is it? To this one. The third observation. <laughs> Thank you. Let me put that. The third observation is from Romans 5.18. Bob, I will write this out and illustrate it, for it's one of my key verses. So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so, through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. Let me ask questions about the verse and lay it out before you clearly. Number one, who is the one who transgressed? Answer, Adam. <laughs> Upon who did the condemnation fall? Answer, all men. Any exception to the word all? None whatsoever. Does all include infants? Indeed it does. Who is the one who did the act of righteousness? Answer, 
the Lord Jesus Christ. To whom has the justification of life come? Answer, all men, circled. Now observe, the second all must be as inclusive as the first all. Does that include infants? Answer, yes. So far, so good. Smile face. <laughs> now we come to a very important principle of Bible interpretation. You will notice that verse, that verse Romans 5.18, by itself, teaches universal salvation. Read it carefully and you'll see that it does. The principle is this, I must never put any limitations on any verse unless God himself does in another place. God limits that verse, then and only then is it legitimate to limit it. Before I show you where God has limited this verse, let me draw it for you. And now there's this wonderful drawing <laughs> of a circle and it says all mankind, and there's a slash through it, and at the top it says infants. The circle will represent all mankind. I just gathered all babies into one section to make the teaching clearer. But look at the whole circle, which includes infants. Romans 5.18 says everyone, through the righteous act of one, that is the cross, Everyone in the whole circle have been justified. Now, does God limit that verse in any place? Indeed, he does. In many places. John 3, 18. He who does not believe has been judged already. Mark 16, 16. He that disbelieveth shall be damned. Do you see it, Bob? God says the whole circle is saved except those who disbelieve. By wording it this way, he limits 518 to believers and infants. And I believe also mentally retarded and all who are perpetual infants. This approach does not base the baby's salvation on some supposed innocency or baptism or some arbitrary love of God. It bases the baby's salvation on the precious blood of Jesus the work he did on Calvary's cross. They too, born in sin, will be able to join in the song of the redeemed in Revelation 5. They have been saved as you and I on the single ground of the finished work of Jesus Christ. This guy was sound. <laughs> anyway, that's why Revelation speaks <laughs> of more in heaven than in hell, because all babies who die in infancy will join the redeemed in heaven, because the righteous act of one. They haven't disbelieved the one thing that would damn them. They haven't rejected, so they are included in the circle of the saved. I believe this approach to the scripture is as sound as a bell. It is not twisting or manipulating, it's simply taking what is said. But you had a double question. Bob, would that apply to the stillborn? In other words, when does life start? And again, I feel as if I have a great news to tell you and your wife. I'll state the teaching of the Bible, then show it to you in the scriptures. I do not hesitate to state it boldly. Life begins at conception when the sperm fertilizes the egg. And from that point on, God regards it as a human life created in His image. Amen. That would mean that not only the stillborn will be with the Lord, but all who die in miscarriage or are murdered by abortion. Psalm 139, 13. Thou, dost form, thou didst form my inward parts, Thou didst weave me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to thee, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are thy works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from thee when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. 
Thine eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in thy book they were all written, the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. These verses show that God has written down all members before they were even formed in the womb. He regards life before the developing process takes place. Such is our God. Such is our gospel. I hope these verses were clear. I'd be glad to answer any other questions and further clarify if I can. I'm grateful for the opportunity of sharing this with you. I pray your hearts will be lifted. I will close with the words of Jesus. To the royal officer at Capernaum, John 4.50. Go your way, your son lives in union with Jesus. Amen. Amen. I think there's somebody here who needed to hear that. Maybe it was a miscarriage. Maybe with a baby dying, you needed to hear that. I knew of Scott's salvation before that letter, but then I really knew it. You have a second son, the boy said. You just have to wait a little while till you see him. Back in 76, I read that letter to a group of college kids who were having Bible study in my home. Three of those guys who were there when I read that letter are here. One young man told me later, I have a mentally handicapped brother. I never knew what would happen to him. Another time, a woman said, I've had several children lost by miscarriage. And I never knew. So I said to Ed, hey Ed, can I bring a bunch of college kids up to your Rhode Island home? And you can teach them. He said, no way. <laughs> he said, how about if I come down to your house? So Ed came to Rhode Island to Maryland. He was accompanied by David Brock's father, who had multiple sclerosis. The second year they came down, the man could have to be crawl up the steps. So I said, after listening to Ed teach, I said, it sure would be a good thing if we could get a group of men together and go away for a weekend and study the Word of God and learn more about Jesus. And maybe Ed would come. So he came, 1977, 1978. We never knew, we, I never had a I've never been to a retreat. I've never been to a men's retreat. I don't, how do you do? What do you do? I don't know. Just come, let it talk. Okay, so that worked. Now, <laughs> was that at Rising Sun? Yeah, that was Rising Sun. That was, in, that was in a place up near Rising Sun, Maryland, called Hilltop Ranch. Hilltop, yeah. Located in Cecil County. Um, we had about 45 or 50 guys come the first couple of years. Those who uh, went to Hilltop would probably remember some of these things. <laughs> if not, you can imagine. <laughs> there was a layout, a big meeting room, living quarters were in each corner. In between the corners on each side was a bathroom. Yeah. The bathroom um, had several stalls, four or five, <laughs> with the spring-loaded door. <laughs> In the middle of the night, somebody gets up. Boing, 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 boing. 
Oh, so it sounds like our room now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they had the squeakiest hinges on them. You were... <laughs> no chairs, yeah. right? No, nope. there weren't any chairs, were there, Bob? That's all right. well, did we sit on the floor? No, no, I think no, we had chairs. Chair. 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 But there was a, there was a, in the big meeting room, there was a moose head down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. See, you're getting the old guys are remembering this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and often, you get up in the morning after we had our donuts, and there would be donuts hanging on the antlers of the moose. <laughs> <laughs> With no ladder in sight, you know. How you <laughs> I remember one of the years, it's, it was really cold, and they, there's a big fireplace at the end, and fire was blazing and I noticed Ed was standing there and he kept turning <laughs> like this as he got toasted on every side. <laughs> yeah. It was the introduction of Saturday Night Live. I never heard of Saturday Night Live. I didn't know I watched that much TV and some guy said, We're gonna laugh now and so he said, I'm gonna make some hamburgers to get something to go. <laughs> he said, I saw that on Saturday Night Live. So somebody said that was funny. So, <laughs> uh, we had a hard time getting these guys up. So I came up with the idea. I would record some John Philip Sousa marches and play them at the entrance to each room. They didn't like that either. <laughs> it was a Stephen Kong who Dana mentioned came two years, shared with us. He, he, he's a very unique young man. He, he could only take two years of it though. He said, he stands there in his suit and his tie, stands there, talked about Jesus, doesn't even have a note. Finally, after two years, he writes me a letter. He says, I'm getting too old for this. This was 25 years ago. <laughs> he's still doing it. So he said, oh, I got two suggestions if somebody you might want to consider. And one of them was Dana and one of another guy. I didn't know either one. And my, my good friend Bill Pritchett says, take that one. So we did. That's how Dana got it. But having seen and met with Jesus, some of the men went home and they were changed. They were changed to the degree that their wives said, we're coming to the next men's retreat. <laughs> <laughs> We knew that would not be good. <laughs> so, a fall conference started in 1978 and it continued through 2014 where we invited the ladies. And Ed shared Jesus with us every year, twice a year, in 1977. And Dana, praise God, joined us in 1983, 33 years ago. And we have been blessed. I don't know something else. Those two have been blessed. So we're here, 40 years later, still seeking more of the same Jesus that we started looking for. So thankful for another time together. In my mind, in my mind, the Lord's plan started to unfold with that impossible pregnancy. And his, his story continued as my son went to glory. And it's continuing today. And his plan, his story, will continue in the lives of many of you as you spread the good news of Jesus as you wander around planet Earth. The Lord's blessings have been apparent for years. I, I wrestled with the idea that I could ask for people to stand up who were there in those early days and share with you blessings. But I know that Ed would get mad if we took his time. So we're not going to do that. You'd have to do that one-on-one. -on -one. Fathers bringing sons. Grandfathers bringing grandsons. Blessing upon blessing. And the Lord used a little boy to make it happen. A little boy not yet seen. Not yet. But soon. 
That's why we're here. That's why the Lord has blessed it for 40 years. 40 years is a long time. We just want to go one time. Just go up the hilltop and talk about Jesus. Well, that was pretty good. Let's do it another time. There was never a plan to have it this many or this many. So it ended up being 40. That's why we're here at Black. Because of the grace of God in a little boy. That's history. That's Jesus' story. That's his story. And no man here could have scripted this by himself. You can do it. Uh, to say that I'm not going to miss you guys is an understatement. To say that most of us won't share in glory for a long, long time is a wonderful thing. But my heart still goes out because I know there's somebody here who doesn't know what we're talking about because they've never confessed the fact that they're a rotten, lost sinner and Jesus wants to save them. We all make mistakes, but you'll never make a bigger one than rejecting Jesus. I, I, I just say to you, right where you are, you get down on the knees of your heart and you talk to him. And he'll be more than glad to save your heart, save your soul. I just wish we could take a whole day and go around and have guys share. You're going to have to talk to them. That's his story. Let's worship him again continually while we're still together as a group. We're going to take up. What's my schedule say? I don't know. I'll take a little break. I think it's 4 o'clock. Oh, yeah, it's 3 o'clock. Did it say 3 or 3.30? Yeah, I see it. Thank you. 3.30. 3.30. Okay, come back 3.30. Thank you for, thank you for being here.